request them. Raise your hand in your heart. Say, God, you know what's in my heart. Let's bow our heads now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee this morning for the true love of God that shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that melts us into one. We are one in Christ. And for this time of fellowship around the Word, we are approaching now, again this morning, we want to thank you for what it's meant to us through this past week, for meeting with our precious dear friends, your children, and for feeling that fine spirit of love and genuineness in their hearts. And we are so grateful, Lord, truly, the Scripture is right when we're assembled together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Bless the further part of the service. Bless our brothers, our pastors, Brother Parker Thomas, thy servant. The Holy Spirit moving upon him and helping him. Lord, he wants to serve you with all of his heart. I pray that his desires will be fulfilled. And the desire behind every hand that was raised here this morning. Bless all your servants throughout the land on this Sabbath day. May you anoint your ministers everywhere that are standing in the pulpit. May the sick be healed, the lost saved, and those who are prepared to see the Holy Spirit. May God be honored today because he has let it be a day. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. I think of that great old song, It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to try to lean upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. This is a telling your precious pastor here, our brother Parker Thomas, that I believe this has been one of the more spiritual impact meetings that I've been into, and I don't know when. Uh, I come down, I say, now I'm going down, and tonight I'm just going to say a few words, and then I'm going to call the people up on the platform and pray for them, and, and I don't want to say too much. You see, I said, now, Brother Parker is a teacher, and what good is my part going to do down there, and, and you just get cut off, <laughs> you know. Just, uh, just keep moving the Holy Spirit. So, and then the first thing you'll look down, down the eyes, nearly nine o'clock, I'm sure. It's almost eleven. <laughs> so you just, well, we're just, just love the fellowship around the world. And so happy. And I, I know you've had a great time at the school or the, the convention up at the tabernacle. Do you know what, people? If I lived around here, I'd, I'd be a member of that place up there. I, would, I sure would. I'd, I'd be right. I am a member of it. And, I mean, I, I'd be going there. I was a member of it because I was baptized into it. <laughs> That's right. I was baptized into uh, that, that great fellowship. You know, I come from a Baptist church, and the Baptists believe that when you are... Uh, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit when you believe. And um, they uh, also believe that if you've been in the Christian church or, or any other church baptizing the same form of baptism they use, the same ceremony, yet when you become a Baptist, you've got to be rebaptized again. In other words, you're baptized by water into the Baptist fellowship. Well, I'm glad to are baptized by one spirit into the fellowship of the Lord Jesus. That's the lasting baptism. Coming in, there was a brother standing out there. He had a movie camera. And he was uh, winding up. And we back then uh, thought you were singing only believe. And I started up step. I seen this precious brother. Something just said, pull out the Lord Jesus. He's taking the movie. And um, he was giving me a testimony. He said that ten years ago his wife was a cancer up in Pennsylvania. In one of our meetings, one of our first, she was healed of, of cancer. 
and you're just way down here today, a brother Roy, I believe he said his name was, and uh, uh, the little bitty fellow standing there, his hair all combed up, cute little fellow, and I said, is this your father or grandfather? He said, no, sir. I said, do you live around here? He said, I'm from Charlotte. <laughs> I said, just speak a word, son. I know you're from the South. <laughs> just speak the trade. <laughs> He's a cute little guy, a little bitty snickle fritz about this time, you know. They're cute. I love that little fellow. In here this morning is a little sweet brother of mine. One time I, not knowing him, I stood for him with all that was in me. And I'd just come back from Sweden. Brother Joseph was having a hard pull in Chicago, and it had a lot against him. Or they called it against him, just because he wanted to be a brother and fellowship with anybody that reached out his hand and said, shake my hand, Joseph was ready to take a hold of it. To me, that's a Christian. But there was a group of ministers that he's associated with a certain people. He's had them in his church, Latter-day Rains and so forth. And we had a meeting booked in Chicago. I said, but aren't we supposed to be interdenominational? I said, yeah, but it, the fellow said, they put me out of my church if I let him come in. I said, then we just won't go if he can't come in. So we uh, bypassed Chicago over that call. And we have been bosom friends all of our lives. Now, if we sit down and try to discuss scriptures, we might miss one another a half a mile or more when it comes to scriptural. But when it comes to brotherly love, we're one. I know he loves God. He believes the same thing about me. And we've had fellowship around and around, going into the mission fields in Africa to provide prepare meetings and where he's a big school God. Those fellow had just unsponsored, un not underwritten by no one, but a vision in his heart to go to Africa. And there he's got thousands. Is that our church, Jeffersonville, showed his film of his school. I want to come over and help him. And this morning, I was eating breakfast down here at um, Howard Johnson's and seeing some of my friends come by, and who came in but Joseph sat down and had breakfast with us. Went home, and we're living right next door to each other, and I've been all tore up for a few days on account of a vision. I haven't told it right after the people, and I'm kind of disturbed. I wonder, what could that be? How can it be? I took my wife and we went aside and I rehearsed back. Where down the road did I have I missed the place? What has happened? And something said while we were standing in my room just a moment before I was going to have prayer and come over. And I was going to speak this morning, teach on the bride tree, but my voice had got bad. And I said, I better bypass that. Because well, it's small. And I said, well, I. Uh, I walked, something said, take Joseph out in the yard. And I cut my arm around him, walked out in the yard. We walked down through these big, spacey pine trees. Seemed like that wind blowing through there, saying, there's a land beyond the river. And I, standing there with my little friend talking, and a certain thing I was talking to him about, which just he and I have known. And he said, But Brother Brandon, well, the Lord gave you this scripture 30 years ago, but did you ever read this? The Lord? It done something to me. I felt the Holy Spirit just come down all around. I said, Thank you, Joseph. I put my arm around him, walked back to the door, went in and picked up my Bible, and there is just exactly what. Why I never read but just them first few verses, I don't know. Just for this hour, that's all. You know, Jesus picked up the scripture one time and just read so much of it. Right. Just as much as to be fulfilled then, and left the rest of it because that part pertains to him in that time, and the next part pertains to him the second time. Right. I may speak on it tonight, Lord willing. I want to go this afternoon and take my Bible and get out into the woods.
alone because it just got me all moved inside and never thought of it, never tried to read it. Twenty about what well, about thirty thirty one years ago. And everything that he told me has been fulfilled and just in the last six months, the last part of the vision that morning, fulfilling here was the fuddle, I guess, is what I call it. Just didn't know which way to turn. And Joseph said, But did you ever read the rest of it? And there it was. Didn't know it. God bless you, Joseph. Ah, uh, ah. I, I love the God's people, don't you? <laughs> Just something real about it. Maybe tonight, the Lord willing, I want to go to the statue and see what he will tell me. What to do. I feel a lot better about it now. I know that. Just, just caught two or three verses now. But oh my, that's why did I read that? Why did I think about it? See? But I just never did notice it. Now, because it wasn't time. Right. Now, Joseph is going to leave us and going to Africa to make arrangements for me. Brother Parker Thomas has been so sweet that asked me to come back again next year time of the convention, and I trust that that will be the will of the Lord I can do that and meet with everybody back here again next year. And the fellowship is very sweet. And now we want to get out of here before noon, and so you can eat and rest and so forth and come back again this evening. Do you have an evening service or afternoon service? I think we have that here this afternoon. Now, anybody that's wanting to be baptized in Christian baptism, where will that be at your church? Oh, there you are. Here's water. What is hindered? All right. All of you eunuchs come down <laughs> and uh, enter into the water. And uh, if you haven't had Christian baptism yet, by mercy, you come to Brother Parker Thomas's uh, house of parish this afternoon, and there will be water for the baptismal service. And that's a good time to set it once forever. That's right. For he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is that right? Repent, every one of you, and be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If that isn't true, then I don't know what is true. Paul said to those people in Acts, the 19th chapter, Paul passes through the upper coast of Ephesus, he finds certain disciples, a great Baptist preacher up there was preaching. Proving by the Bible that Jesus was the Christ. He said, Have Paul come to an Aquila and Priscilla, tent makers, friends of Paul's, which absolutely Aquila and Priscilla were the pastors of the church. He, uh, Aquila was the pastor of the church, the first church at Rome. And when Claudius had excommunicated all Jews, he'd come back to Palestine. I'd like to talk to the Catholic Church on that. Why was Peter over there then? <laughs> All right. Now, but he had been excommunicated from uh, Rome and been brought over into uh, uh, his homeland called then Aquila and Priscilla. Then when they went back then, these Roman bishops over there had brought in all the dogma. And that's what started your first Catholic Church right there. And then he established the second Catholic Church, which then when Paul came to Rome, he came to the second church. Want somebody to show me where Paul ever went to the first church? <laughs> you wouldn't believe those dogmas. Could you imagine Peter, a Jew, taught against idols, but idols in the church? Do you remember Peter so strict on the word and staying with the word that ever said dogma? Right. I think, no, no, not that. That's just foolish. But there it goes. And that's the way it starts. Now, we uh, find out that Paul passed into the upper coast of Ephesus and he finds certain disciples. They were rejoicing, happy. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Wasn't that a knockout for the Baptist? <laughs> the Baptist said you received the Holy Ghost when you believe. And that's exactly what their first beginner thought. That's what Apollos, he said, 
he thought they'd already given his all right. He said, uh, uh, they were shouting, having a great time. Paul said, that's all right. Uh, Pull up for still have done and we got a little reverend Paul, but when he comes up, he'll teach the word of the God to you more plainer. So he passed through the upper coast, he finds this Baptist theologian, great man, good man, and he said to his congregation, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He said, we don't want to be the Holy Ghost. He said, then how was you baptized? He said, well, we've been baptized. How? I don't know why. He said, unto John's baptism, he said, he only baptized unto repentance. The sacrifice hadn't been killed yet. See? Not for remission of sin. That's right. Acts 2 38 said, to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. See? But he said, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He said, we know where to be the Holy Ghost. What was you baptized? It must be essential. Yeah. And he said, we have not so much in the word of the Holy Ghost. He said, how was you baptized? Or to what? The original says to how? And he said, unto John's baptism, he said, John very baptized them to repentance, saying unto the people, they should believe on him that was to come, that is Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were rebaptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul laid his hands upon them, and they received the Holy Ghost come upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Right. Oh, that's a good Pentecostal doctrine to me. Sure is all right. So now, if you haven't had Christian baptism, come down this afternoon. And then, here not long ago, just before we start, you know that my precious old mother has just gone up the road. And if I had time, I'd tell you how it happened, how the Lord told me, bypassing a hunting trip I had and sent me to another place and told me what I would get and return back and just exactly where everything was laying perfectly. I told it to the church before I ever left. I said, I'm going to kill a nine-foot silver-tipped grizzly. I'm going to kill a caribou that his horns measure exactly 42 inches from the base up. And he'll be laying on a little panoramic, never been in the country, told the church, Part of the church is sitting here this morning. Is that right, church? Raise up your hands for the banner. I said, just for you to be. Some of the brethren went with me to find out. We went into a country we'd never seen before. And just perfectly to the dot where everything was, the, the silver tip grizzly measures exactly nine feet from tip to tip. And the uh, he's killed just in the same place, he says, the caribou land looking right down the mountain at me. And that guy said, Brother Branham, if that caribou horns measures 42 inches, I'm going to spank it. I said, you might as well drop over the boat. He's going to measure it when he got it. Measure out, and there it was at an almost spot nose, not a sixteenth over, exactly forty-two inches. I said, "Don't you believe?" He, year before that, we was back in a place, and he's just a young convert, and he heard about the meeting. His wife is a Pentecostal believer. He's a guy, brother Southway. Up, he said, "If anybody ever questions that, let him write and ask me." He said, "Let me tell him." His way back. That's the land of the midnight sun in the Yukon there. So he. And uh, we've been back, and the Indians back there had, had got across the waters, and the right waters had cut us off, and we couldn't go back. So we just sat around there a few days, just talking, watching the great outdoors, and taking pictures of different things. And so he kept Eddie kept telling one of the ministers about the visions, and he said, "Oh my, if I could just only, if I could get my brother down there." And he said, "My brother has had epilepsy, my young brother." That he's had epileptic since he's about three years old. He has four or five fits a day. So I know he is, he is praying to God, but I can't make visions come. They just come. That's the grace of God. I, I don't. So we was back there. I prayed for him two or three times, him not knowing him. We went around the next day. We had about 21 head of horses. And, and down on the trips, usually a tied tail halter like that. But in those mountains, you can't use it that way because you lose a whole string of horses. And sometimes he'd fall off a cliff. And uh, on the road out, we let the horses loose, these young horses rolling their packs and things. I used to ride a lot, and my father was a rider. And so we was coming up, and I was in the back of wrangling. Bud was in front of this brother Eddie, brother Bud, and I, and another Christian called Chris Bird. And so Bud was riding on in the front with a bell horse trying to, to lead on, and I was coming in the back. Eddie and I get these horses out of Mesquite. I, I guess you all know what Mesquite is, and they get in that's like quicksand. We had a couple down, and oh, I was mud from head to foot, and 
And along there, get them horses out, and one of them jumped in, and I was jumped in on top of him, held his head up like that, we got a rope around, so dog him a saddle horn like that, and took one horse and cut the other packs off and got him out of there and just take mud and scrape off of you like that. <laughs> oh my, them young horses, you can't, they just go anyway, they're two or three year old, just broken, they're not trail horses at all. And so we were going out, and I got up and I was riding along the saddle, and, and, uh, and Ed was there, and I had to look out across that great big tree, pine trees, the snow across the top, and God, let me live there, and if, if there's a millennium to come, let me live there. That, you can have all your fancy hair trimmed yards and your big buildings and all your Miami uh, palm trees lit up and all you want, but just let me have it the way God sent it. Just, uh, I just love it like that. Oh, I can just stand at the top of those hills, go hunting and climb way up the top of the hills and sit there and just hold up my hands and cry. I look across and I say, God, that must be the way you love it. That's the way you must. That's the way you made it. Why does man have to contaminate it? Maybe something else. Pervert it. Someday I thought, Lord, let me walk down your big never ending game trails. I hope I meet all you hundred brothers down along through there. We'll go around looking at I'm looking forward to that. Of course, you know that's the Indian's prayer. From the, when um, going down there, I was looking out across like that, and I seen that young fella in a vision. The horse stopped itself. I didn't have to stop him. I watched that vision for a few minutes, and when it left, I seen it was for Bud's brother. I only had one spur, and I spurred my little horse and turned him around. I run up to Eddie real quick. I had a horse run out into some brush there, and I, I said, Eddie, Eddie, brother, he said, what's the matter, brother? Man, you look white in the sheet. I said, I've got dust. Hey, that's the law. <laughs> what is it? For Bud's brother? I said, yes. I said, keep the horses going. And I spurred my horse. And, Got across and through the Muskegon thing. About 15 minutes, I jumped ahead of the string. I rode beside of Bud and put my hand over on the back of his saddle. And I said, Bud? He said, yes, Brother Branham. I said, I got dust, say the Lord. He said, what do you mean? I said, for the last two or three days since we've been back here, you've constantly talked about if you could ever get your brother in one of the meetings. He said, yes, Brother Branham. He just... He, he hasn't even received the Holy Ghost as yet. He had now, but he had not name. And he said, uh, uh, yes, that is right. And I said, your brother described him. He said, that's exactly right. That's the way he looked. I said, this won't work on another person, but it will on your brother. I told him, I said, you stand and get your brother. Bring him up here. He's on an Alaskan highway. He lived in an old place where the Americans there were several of them died and put the road through and the government all fell in and he was guiding. He got 600 square miles in there. He's a licensed guide. And so he said, very primitive, very fine hunting country. And I said, Bud, look, when that boy comes and he has a fit again, grab his shirt and say, Brother Branham told me to do this in the name of the Lord and so that had a I said, the fit will leave him. Do you believe me? He said, with all my heart. Set and got his brother, brought him up there, and that morning he went to cut trail. His little wife, sweet little Christian, but she, he got violent, he'd get rational too. So just he hadn't been out of the house somewhere about 30 minutes, down somewhere, and he fell in one of those fits. Usually the little wife would clear a window and ain't getting away from him. But when she seen him rolling and tumbling and that devil uh, doing that to him, she had to remember, she believed me. Here she comes to him and straddled him, that little bitty woman, that red, big, wide shouldered man. She straddled him and jerked that shirt off of him, walked over that cellar, and her tears running down her cheeks, said, Dear God, Brother Branham told us to do this, and I throw this in there in the name of Jesus Christ. He's never had a fit for me. <laughs> when I told him about those visions and what would happen, coming down the mountain, we shot that caribou on top of the mountain. He said, Brother Branham, according to that vision, we was in caribou moss, you know, it exceeds for miles and miles and then gets the yellow moss. He said, according to what you told me out, that man is going to have the, the shirt on Eddie down there, that checkered shirt, you're going to kill a nine-foot silver tip grizzly. I said, that's the day of the law. He said, Brother Branham, I, I, I'm not doubting your word, brother. How could I doubt your word? He said, but look, I can see every speck of the ground and there's nothing in the bush that high. 
I said, I carried them off. Where's the bear at? I said, he's Jehovah Jireh. The <laughs> Lord will provide for himself. I said, did you ever hear the story about the squirrels that time? He said, Eddie told me about it. I said, well, he's still God. If he says it'll be there, he said, well, Brother Branham, if God's told you that this caribou is laying exactly what, I've never seen one like it. He said, I don't see how in the world he ever got to it. Here's 50 yards of it. And said, just exactly what you said. He said, told me, he said, my brother was healed just exactly. That's been over a year ago. He's had three or four fits a day. He's never had one since. He said, how could I doubt it? But he said, Brother Branham, I've lived in these mountains all my life. And I've never seen a silver tip in my life. So said, I've seen regular grizzly, but not a silver tip. That's a rare type. I said, but there's one here. <laughs> so I picked up the head, a horns of this. We'd take, I had the rifle, and we'd take turns about coming down, having to walk this way down the hill. That caribou moss, miles, about three and a half miles, right down before he even hit timber. And so, see, that's not even bear country. That's a caribou. So we went down. Foot by foot, we changed that trophy I was packing. Weighed, well, the caribou itself weighed around 900, but we had to leave the meat there, and I just took the cape and the horns alone weighed about 150 pounds. So here I was trying to pull it down the hill like this over my shoulders. And when we got within about, we come over a little glacier, and he said, think of it, Brother Ram, we're only about a mile to where I can see my natural eyes where them horses are standing. And I see you every hill. And you're going to kill a nine foot silver tip grizzly? I said, that's according to the word of God that told me about three months ago, and it's never failed. I said, you're doubting that, buddy. He said, forgive me, Brother Brandon. I'm not doubting. He said, my heart is so, I just can't understand it. He said, where's the bear at? I said, I don't know. I said, God's got him sticking around here somewhere. He said, think of it. A bear that I've never seen. And one that God told you. He said, that's the same God who told you about my brother. I said, absolutely. He said, Brother Brandon, put a shell in your gun. <laughs> I, said, I said, I don't have time to do that. We go on down the hill. We could then about, about a half a mile. And he had been packing, and I'd had the rifle. So we sat down, rested. He said, Brother Brandon, just think, we're only half a mile. I said, but. And I said, he'll be there, don't you worry. No. I said, but. What is that standing right up there, about two miles up top of the mountain? He told the glass and home, said, Brother Brandon, it looks like a milk cow. He said, it's a grizzly bear, so help me. And look at that white grizzles of boy and that sun setting this afternoon. He's a silver tip. I've never seen it before. I said, what are we waiting on? He said, I believe if you just shoot him in here, it's two miles away. You'll get him. <laughs> I said, but God, according to the vision, I was just right close to him. So tired, worn, we had done been at least 20 miles that day to over those mountains. So then we started right back up again, and I got within about 500 yards, and Bud said, Brother Brandon, he said, did you ever shoot a silver tip before? I said, I've killed many bears, but never a silver tip. And he said, uh, they're the most vicious of all, so they don't go dying. I said, no bear does. So... I said, he said, but the Lord gave you that one, didn't he? I said, oh, yeah. So I had a little 270. It's a small rifle. And so then I went on up just a little farther, and he said, Brother Ben, don't you think you'd better shoot him from here? We better not get too close to him. I said, the vision says he's right up on him. So we went over in a little coulee and come up, and when we did, there, my, just stepped about 250 yards there, I could see his big yellow teeth smacking down like that. It looked like a big haystack, 18 inches between the ears, and... He was a mammoth foot about that wide and tall, you know, and just sat there, oh, he looked pretty mean. So Bud said, <clears throat> he said, Brother Branham, uh, I'll tell you where to shoot him. I said, yes, sir. He said, the back, you see. He said, then they can't get up in, you see. I said, but the vision said, shoot him in the heart. He said, well, then you're going to do it that way. <laughs> And there we come down, and he said, Brother Benham, we packing them horns, didn't have a measure. He said, them horns look about 90. I said, no, they're just 42. He said, yeah. and I told Eddie, I said, now watch, the little boy's going to put his hands around there to measure. 
And when we got down to where the tax was, we couldn't bring the bear. I had to go back to the next day. You can't get a bear. You can't get a horse near a grizzly bear. You know that the smell of it. He's gone. We threw up two or three strings trying to get him out. And so then, um, all he had a man. He's laying all over everything. The pack saddles and pure scattered them horses are scared to death of the grizzly. The smell of them. So we went on down. And when we stopped, and the boys is there waiting. Eddie and his son. And he said, I want to measure those horns. I pulled back to Eddie. I said, Eddie, watch the boy put his hands around the bottom of the horns. Now, as I told you before we got here. So he goes down, gets out of the tape, out of his, his little measure. The little boy come around and put his hands on it. And he said, <laughs> Just exactly raised her up like that. He just turned white in the face. He said, Brother Branham, look at here. Not one sixteenth over, exactly 42 inches on the down. Jesus never failed. He said, Brother Ben, where am I going to be a year from today? I said, Now, bud, you're just a young convert to Christ. I don't know where you're going to be. I said, I can only say just as he tells me. That's what I say. That's all I know. And I don't know. Now, I'm going back into a country that you might not want to come back next year. I'm going to get a brown bear. It's almost twice that size. You see if it's right or not. I've seen it when I was standing, put my hands on his haunch and laying on the ground like that, and I could put my hands on his hips like that and then laying down. Now you find out that's right or not. There's a whole lot to that, but I just have to think I'm supposed to be teaching Sunday <laughs> Oh, friends, you all see these little visions around here. No wonder you minister, brother, sometimes gets suspicious. Well, it might be mental telepathy, it might be psychology. Show me somewhere else what's going on. Hallelujah. Amen. What about these great psychologists? So let them They guess it sometimes happens, sometimes it never, and this, that, the other, but God's perfect. What is, one of the, what is a fortune teller is a perverted servant of Christ. What is any wrong is a perverted right. Exactly right. There, it's never. It's just now and then. That's why taking a chance on Christianity. Don't take chance. Be sure that you're right. Just, just die to yourself and be born again of the Spirit of God, and then you'll know. Then there's no all the ifs and ands are gone from it. I love him. Because it was given to us at the beginning. 
We could not be here if it wasn't for you. And to think that the grace of God come down into our midst in these last days. And God, the great creator, has made himself known to us by forgiving our sins and appearing before us in such marvelous ways as he promised it would be in the evening time. The evening light to shine. Grant it, Father, that we'll fellowship around thy word now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry to have helped you like that. Let us read now on a scripture. Just a short one. We're going to be out now in just about 35, 40 minutes. Lord willing. Numbers 14. I said that because I might make a mistake. I, I, see, I don't know what he's going to do. Somebody might get something here in a few minutes. The Holy Spirit might come into this. I'm looking for something to happen. I don't know. So I, I, if I don't know, then I'm just going to say, if he is willing to say Yes, sir. But I know the Holy Ghost might come up here and strike one of these brothers sitting on the pulpit and might do something here to just turn the whole thing. There might be a falling of the Holy Ghost in a few minutes of this. This wouldn't close for two or three more weeks. Just day and night, constantly going all over. I don't know what he's going to do. And you again, we might hear the trumpet sound. Numbers 14, 41, down to 45, reading the word of the Lord now. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you trespass the commandments of the Lord, but it shall not prosper? Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye may be smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword. Because ye are turned away from the Lord, wherefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. And the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites had dwelt in the hill and smote them and discomfort them even to harm. Now for just a, to draw a little lesson out of here this morning, just to talk. Now I believe that we are here to, in a Sunday school, to be taught, to learn. And if we can go back and find out in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, how people were blessed of God and how that they were cursed of God and see what God respected and required, then we'll have some idea of how to maintain the blessings of God. Do you think so? I'm not going to preach. I haven't got enough voice for that. But I, and remember, I... Constantly we be going till this coming September. I've got about two days between the meetings from September. The Lord willing. Now, we want to find out. Let me say it again now. Take our time for these few minutes we have. Now, we've got to go back. And if we can see what God desired, what he required, what he cursed, what he blessed. Then let's take them for example. I believe in Hebrews the eleventh chapter. No, the twelfth chapter. Said, seeing that we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every sin, or every weight and the sin that so easily beset us, that we might run with patience the race that's set before us. Now we got to go back. Paul here, as we believe he was the writer of the Hebrews, was showing back what man of faith and great warriors was. Then we can take the other side. I got a book at home that tells the last words, Brother Newton, I got it from him many years ago, the last words of great men and women that lived on the earth. And I believe it was Bloody Mary in England 
that her last words when she was dying said, I'd give my kingdom for five minutes more of life. No. I got Abraham Lincoln's last word. I got Stonewall Jackson's last word. You know what Jackson's last words were? A great Southern general, I join with you rebels in thanksgiving to God for a general like Jackson. He's never been com compared anywhere to any other general as far as I'm concerned. He was a great man of God. And uh, Jackson said when he was dying, just fixing to cross the river, he said, we'll soon cross the river, and then we'll sit down on the tree and rest. That's right. I heard Dwight Moody's last word. Raised up and said, Is this death? So this is my carnation day. Lives of great men are all in mind us. We can make our lives sublime, but parties leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. I like that. Footprints that perhaps another while sailing over life's solemn main, or for long and shipwrecked brother in seeing shall take part again. Paul Rader. How many of you ever heard of Paul Rader? I used to hear him preach when I was a little boy. Little did I know then that I'd take his song, Only Believe, around the world. When Paul was dying out there, he had a little. Uh, Quartet come down from Moody Bible School. You know what Paul said to a friend of mine when he knew he was dying, had cancer? He said, If I would have took my message of grace and sold it to the red hot Pentecostals instead of come here, that's what killed him. That'd have been better off. So Moody, Paul had a sense of humor. He and Brother Boswell and all of them were just some friends. Billy Sunday, Brother Boswell was having a meeting up there one time in Chicago. Raider Tabernacle. And so uh, Billy Sunday had been there three weeks and he preached out all of his sermons. And he's, Paul had been there about two years. He's preaching on. So Billy said to Paul, he said, Paul, when do you ever run out of sermons? He said, when I get a kink in the hose. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody ever heard Paul preach, He'd start Genesis 1, that's the Revelation. He'd preach the whole Bible to me every time he preached. I used to watch him. He'd take a, something in his mind and get way back. Great big man, he'd pull up his trousers, you know. Great big man, he'd run his arms, he could almost go to the top of the pulpit. I got a big pair with his hands out. But when he was dying out there, Moody Bible School set down a quartet, they were standing there with the shades all down in the hospital, singing, Near, oh my God, to thee. Paul raised up and said, Hey, who's dying, me or you? <laughs> he said, Raise them shades and sing me some good, God snappy gospel songs. <laughs> so they begin to sing, Down at the cross where my Savior died, down there for cleansing from sin, I cried. There to my heart was a blood of white old glory to his name. He said, Where is Luke? That's his brother. And many of you knew Luke, he just recently went. Luke and Paul were two brothers that stayed together, something like Billy, my son, and I. He said, where's Luke? Luke is in the next room. He didn't want to see his brother die. So I said, tell Luke to come over here. They brought Luke in. Luke trying to choke it back. Paul raised up, took over his hands and said, Luke, we've been here on any day together, haven't we, brother? He said, yes, Paul. He said, think of it. In five minutes from now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness. Yeah. Lives of great men are all remind us that we can make our lives divine, but parties leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Let me go like that. Let me go with that testimony like Moody had. Let me go with the testimony like Paul had. I fought a good fight, I finished the course. Death worries your stain. Grave worries your victory. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Therefore, basing back in the Old Testament, I draw these conclusions for a, a little message now. Pursuing. Webster, I've got wrote out here, Webster says to pursue is to venture without actual authority. 
That's pursuing. Or, in parentheses, he's got Webster taking it for granted. Just take it for granted. Or to venture without authority. Or take something just for granted. Now that's something that the church must not do. You, you're not sure of yourself if you're just pursuing. For you're just taking it for granted. Now we have, each year we pass a holiday. The, I'm sorry to say this, but it shows so. The average American Christian, so-called, Billy Graham made the same statement one time and he read his article about how many drunks there was in so-called Christianity. The average so-called Christian of some church and the sinner alike, which to me they're all in the same boat. People drink and try to just drown out past sin. The cheap lies on the weekend. They try to get drunk. Just think, well, just pass it off. They're presuming that that's the right way to do it. They see you that that's the way to forget your sin. Just drink it out. You don't realize you're only heaping more sin. But they presume that that's the American way to do it. And that may be true, but it isn't the Bible way of doing it. But they presume that that's all right. I said that to you, you're not long ago. I was speaking on a subject where I'd been in Canada with my good brother Southland there, and I come down to a, a great big hotel that he was so generous to put me in. And the Americans was up there in Canada, a certain club of America that was having their convention there. And I tell you when I come in that night, well there was Miss America with Oh, terrible. And whiskey bottles all over everything. And I went on up to the room I got off, and I looked at that little fellow. This couple of people got off, man holding one another, a club. Then when I, the little elevator, I said, my goodness. Woo. He said, oh, they're having a real time. I said, they sure look at yeah. So we went up to the door and opened the door. We just got out of the elevator and started down. There was two young women, both of them wearing wedding bands. Pretty little women, just with their underneath garment on, standing up at the end of the hall, and they had a whiskey bottle in their hand. And as they started down there, trying to hold one of their eyes glassy, starry, and their manicure on their lips had run down and that black stuff and them women putting that ring around you look like a monkey, not a human being. Right there, what's the matter? And all that stuff and that big waterhead haircut, you know. You are pretty. You don't make yourself look like a prehistoric animal. You're the right away God made you. And here they, these girls, women, Stand up there, and they started down through the hall, staggering. And some man come out, drunk, grabbed one around the place of her body. He should not have done it. And trying to hold her, she staggered around. He come down. She got away from a couple bunches of them. I just stepped back and watched it. And as they got close, standing there with just a little underneath garment. Of course, that's more than some of them wear. And then they had this bottle. One of them. Give one a drink, and this other taking a big drink out of this bottle of whiskey, and she pulled up this little skirt as high as she could, kicked her feet way up in her heart. Whoopee! She said, "This is living it up. This is life." Now watch both them fingers. I don't maybe a husband home baby said it. What is it? Trying to have a little fun. 
what they call clean American fun. They've been washing dishes, working in the office, and they're just, just kind of, just like that, trying kind to of let off the steam. And I said, I beg your pardon. That's not life, that's death. So she looked around. She said, you want to drink out of my bottle? I thought of the hands. I said, I'm a gospel preacher. I'm an American too, but I'm ashamed of you. And the other started around, I caught her with the other hand. I said, do you women go to church? And you seem to sober a little. Tell the bottom now that, yes, sir. One of them was a Sunday school teacher. I said, aren't you ashamed of yourself to call yourself a Christian? I tried to hold him, just pulling and jerking, jumping like that, and down the hall they went. One of them fell and sprawled over the floor, and then tried to pick her up feet first, and said, all the sights you ever seen, I thought, God, how can you look upon such? But they presume that's all right. Because you're only a member of an organization. If they were born again, they wouldn't be doing it. I believe it was Calvin. No, it was John Smith. I'm not sure now the man. But one day in his mission, one of the early great saints of the last two or three hundred years, I forget who it was. I believe it was a Methodist. John Smith, it might have been. But however... They're standing at the door, and down the street come a drunk. He fell in a gutter. And there's a man passed by and said, John, that is one of your converts. He said, yep, that's right. If he was the Lord, he wouldn't be there. <laughs> so that's it. If you're converted to a creed, if you're converted to an organization, if you're converted to a church, you'll do those things. But when you become a convert of Christ, you're born again and you're dead to those things and alive. But people go right on pursuing. It's all right to do that. Venturing out without authority. Preachers, good man, fine man, preach denominational doctrine, pursuing, that's all is required. And when this Bible says, Whosoever shall take one word out of it, or add one word to it, the same will be taken out of the book of life for him. Amen. Say, you don't need the Holy Spirit today. That was for a day gone by. Why? They can't teach anything different if they are that excommunicated. They say there's no such a thing as healing. The Holy Spirit was only given to the apostles. Now they get that because they're taught that in the school, presuming that that's right. But it's wrong. Heavens and earth will pass away, but God's word will not. And he said, let every man's word be a lie and mind the truth. But they pursue. And that's all right. Say, well, that's all we know. If you went down to a restaurant for your dinner, and uh, I guess it's still dinner here. Up where I come from, up in Indiana, they're trying to get modern in there. They're trying to say we had breakfast and we had lunch and dinner. I'm always left out. Where's my supper coming? <laughs> I said, do you take the Lord's dinner or the Lord's supper? Nonsense. Put on the dog. That's all. Oh, he's classical, he's educated, pursuing us all right. We don't need that. Preaching denominational doctrine, pursuing that's all right. And people go join with me. Pursuing that's all right. That's all they have to do. Just pursue, well, I'm a church member. You know, one day I was in a prayer line. And coming along, and there's a lady coming up on a platform, and, well, she's got a right to do anything she wants to, I guess, and she 
had enough jewelry on to support a missionary ten times around the world. And I said, uh, are you a, are you a Christian? She said, I am an American. Doesn't that settle it? I said, not with me, it does. I said, I asked you if you was a Christian. Not a hitchhiker. No, no. But a born again Christian. She thought because she was an American, that settled it. Brother Biles was having a prayer night over in Detroit one time, and a girl came up on the platform to be prayed for. She said, are you a Christian? Why, she was shocked. She said, I think you can understand I'll burn a candle every night. <laughs> for sure, That's all they have to do. They're from the smart people. They're men and women. And they, in their heart, they, they, they want to serve God. Those monks go into monasteries. Ministers go to seminaries. They get degrees of psychology and how to bow before the people and how to be a, a, the psychological effect it has on the people pursuing and that's all they have to do. Even in some of our great denominations, Pentecostal. Now, I ain't talking about Methodists and Baptists. I'm talking about Pentecostal. You're not long ago, we got some issues. Each one pulled off to himself with little issues pursuing that's what they ought to have done. That's what they ought not have done. Stay together. All of them. Don't take your issues out like that. Bring it in here and pray it out. Amen. You can have your issue and still love your brother all right. But when you lose respect and fellowship with your brother, your issues kill you. Right. But there you are. They presume that that's all they have to do. Because that's what they're taught. They just go join church. They say, are you a Christian? I'm a Methodist. Are you a Christian? I'm Presbyterian. Then they join them. And now you say, are you a believer? I'm Pentecost. Well, let me straighten that out for you. There is no such a thing as Pentecostal organization. Pentecost is an experience, not an organization. Catholics has got it. Baptists have it. Presbyterians have it. Anybody can have it. It's an experience. Not, you can't organize it. You got your organization, you got away from Pentecost. Man. They never did organize. God never did have an organization. Never one time I challenge you to show me. And I challenge any historians to tell me and show me in history where any time that God sent a message and they organized it, it died by the end, never raised again. The cursed thing. So just look back in your history and find out if that's right. But they make up their creeds and join it. People think that's right. Women. You know I love you, my sister. You know that. I don't stand to hurt you. I love you. But what am I going to do that that day? When I know the Bible teaches what for women to do. And then I know it to be the truth. And then if the watchman sits on the wall and sees the enemy among the people and don't warn them, God said, I'll require the blood of the watchman's hand. When pastors let you cut your hair off Amen. and say that that's right, that pastor is a, telling you something that's wrong. Amen. When he lets you dress in immodest clothes and tell you that uh, that's all right. That's wrong. Amen. And uh, it's not. You, you're pretty. You know, everything in the, in the line of female and male, always the male is the most pretty. Take the rooster and the hen. Take the bird family. Take the elk, the bull or the cow. Take the deer, the buck or the doe. Everything is always the prettiest in the male line, except the human race. The male is ugly, burly, 
peered over his face. Many times bald headed and rugged looking, hairs all over him. But the female is dainty, pretty. That's where Satan lays right there. That's where he chose at Eden. That's where he got through at Eden. That's what he's used ever since. You tell me any nation in history, some of you school kids. In the fall of the nation, as soon as motherhood was broke and womanhood, that nation's backbone was broke. Talk about morals in our country. I got a piece out of the paper on the Associated Press that when our boys went overseas, that four out of every six was divorced by their wife and stayed home before they were there six months. And there was more illegitimate children born in the state of New York during, in one year before the war, and there was soldiers killed in the entire four years of war. Presuming that's all right. Women put on little sexy clothes and walk out on the streets. Say, yes, I'm a Christian. They're presuming that's the thing they should do. Now, please, sister, I'm your brother. If your mother was the right kind of a woman, she'd tell you the same, or your daddy, you're your husband. And any man will let his wife get out on the street in them shorts and things like that. It shows how much man's in him. <laughs> let his wife sit there and smoke a cigarette before him and know that that thing, what's his children going to be? Don't worry about communism and whooping them. We don't whoop ourselves. It's her own rotten moil. Where did it start from? Because the gospel was let out at the pulpit. Once yeah. again, sissified preachers with not enough real baptizing of the Holy Spirit in their soul to stand and tell the word of God. Yeah. Don't spank the child for juvenile delinquency. Spank the parent for parent delinquency. And let them get by with it. And that's the reason I'm right across that clergy there. How can you read the same Bible I am? So did those 400 prophets down there in Israel read the same Bible that Michael read. But he was willing, seriously, to take his stand. Amos, in his day, that peerless prophet of God, walked up there to Samaria. He looked over that city and he seen all the corruption is in it and he said, the very God that you claim that you love will destroy you. Amen. He seen the corruption of it. They were presuming they were all right. They had their priests or synagogues. They thought this long as I'm a Jew circumcised, that's all I need to be. They claimed that they served God. They, they, what have they done? They've taken the fashions of the outside nations. They made an alliance with them. And they thought as long as they had favor with the outside nations, well, that's all they had to do. They made alliance. They stripped their women. They walked through the streets. They burlesqued and everything else. And that old prophet standing there, his eyes narrowed over his beard. The tourists come from all over the world around to see this great Samaria. But that prophet seen it through a different eye. Amen. The day the people and ministers are looking at all the churches, numbers and numbers. But a born-again Christian looks at it through a different eye. He looks at it through the Word of God. And he calls out the corruption in it. The very God that they claim to serve will bring judgment down upon them. His prophecy just taken 13 years to come to pass. Jerome II, it, you know how it come to pass. Jeroboam, brother. Leave it was. Now you are John. Sister, before I leave it. Did you ever realize, when you dress like that and go out on the street, you may be a little lady. I believe you are, honey. That's right. I believe you're a little lady. I don't believe you're bad. I don't believe you want to be bad. I don't believe a, a Catholic nun goes into a nunnery to be bad. That poor woman goes in there because she wants to get closer to God. I don't believe you want to be bad. I don't believe it should be a bad girl. I don't believe you're being decent to your husband. But do you realize the Catholic nun doesn't realize that the system is sending her in there? And you don't realize the spirit of the day that's making you do those things. You presume it's all right, but it isn't. 
Now look, Jesus said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart. Now you go out dressed like that, them shorts on and dressed all sexy and everything, sure you're pretty. But God didn't make you like that. Satan is making a bait out of you and you don't know it. Now let a man look at you, a little Christian girl coming down the street, pretty, sweet, little, some little thing, all dressed sexy, and a sinner looks upon her to lust after her. At the day of the judgment, when this man answers for committing adultery, who's guilty? Her. See what I mean? I, I, maybe someday you'll find out it's not me trying to be a smart aleck. It's with godly love. See? I love you. I don't want you to be like that. Don't be like the rest of the world. You Pentecostal women, your organizations were invited in and made themselves an organization. And there are times you compare their congregation with a well-dressed groom and the best-dressed people. That's the devil. Don't you believe that? They're presuming it's all right, but it isn't. God said not to do it. Go ahead, preach it. Join. They think it's all right, just presuming. And you know, people said this. God is a good God. Yeah. Oh, Brother Brandon, someone said to me, you try to stay right with that word. It, 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 just what it says. Don't you think it, it don't make any difference? A fellow had been sprinkled not long ago. And he said, I baptized him. And so another man got at me about it. He said, well, he was already baptized. I said, no, he wasn't. He was sprinkled. Baptized, he baptized him, he's covered up, buried. And I said, I baptized him. And he said, Brother Adam, <laughs> you're a radical. I said, maybe I am, but it's for the right cause. And I said, I'm zealous of God and his word. I'm zealous of his church. I was a outcast. Nobody loved me and cared for me. When I found you Pentecostal people that loved me, and believe this gospel. I come among you not to be an enemy to you, but to be a brother to you. To, to, to show you God's word. Let some of the pastors come stand by me one time, before you, and say it's wrong. That's the only way to prove it. Now, here's what happened. I said I baptized him. Or he said, Brother Brandon, do you really think it makes a difference? I said it did with Paul. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, we're not worthy to be one. He said, then what was you baptized? said, under John. So that was only to, unto repentance, not remission of sin. They were baptized over again. And Paul said in Galatians 1, if an angel from heaven, let alone a preacher, if an angel from heaven would preach any other gospel in this that I preached unto you, let him be accursed. I see you don't presume you've got to, it's got to be the truth. Stay with me. But just pursue me. They you hear so much today I say again about God being a good God. You know, as a teenage boy said not long ago, said, you know, the Lord just loves me so well he says to do anything. <laughs> My friend, he is a good God. I'll admit that, but he's a God of justice. He's a God that requires justice. How can he be just and, and disobey his own laws? How can he defile his own holy laws? If he's just, he has to stick for what he said. If he'll require this of you and you don't come to that point, if he isn't just, then why didn't you let Eve get by with that one little misconstrue of the word? Why did he let the 6,000 years of suffering and, and perils and death and sorrow strike the human race? He could not do nothing else but be that. He's just. And he's a God of anger. A God of justice. And his holiness, it, it, be, it behooves him to be that. Not one iota. Right on the line. You come to that or you're on this side or that side. No matter how good you may be, 
how gentle you may be, how quiet, how sweet. Who can get any more gentler and more what we call love than the Christian sign? That's your whole wrap up is love. Amen. That's not real love. Amen. They even deny Jesus being divine. Amen. Deny the death, the birth, the, the virgin birth. Deny his blood. And just talk about love. Could you imagine me having a little boy saying, Oh, honey, you just go ahead. If you want to drink that liquor, you little six-year-old boy, go ahead, Daddy. It won't stop you. I love you too much. Oh, honey, if you want to take my shotgun with two shells and the hammers back, uh, go ahead. I love you too much to stop you. <laughs> that ain't love. Amen. What if he's out on the street and said, Daddy, I want to make mud pies. I hear cars are going 60 miles an hour down the street. I love you too much, honey, to stop you. You want to do that. I know it. Daddy loves you too well to stop you. Go on out there and get killed. A real daddy will shut the hell for me. That's what's the matter with day. You're trying to preach the gospel with soft gloves on. Pursuing it's all right. What the church needs today is to be shut down. Come back to the gospel. You're presuming it's all right. I'm a Pentecostal. I'm this, that, or the other. That's all right. It's not all right. Not according to the word. You've got to come to the word. Such a good God. They don't presume that He's a God of justice. He's a God that must keep His word. Now, Israel here presumed that they were all right. Now I've got ten minutes to finish. Get out on time. Israel here presumed. They went up. The Bible said they did. Well, they said, look, we're the people of God. God come down there to Egypt and got us. Sent his prophet down there with a pillar of fire over him. Brought us up there and slave, slew Pharaoh right before us. Smoked the lion with plagues, trees, lice. Sent fire and hail upon the land and he protected us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And we come up here to the Red Sea. Here comes Pharaoh. God just opened up the Red Sea by His mighty power and we marched through the Red Sea. God loved us through all eternity. Look around, your enemy. I'll drown behind you. Glory to God. Not only that, but He sent us angels food. He fell out of heaven every night. And that prophet said, and the Word of God was with the prophet. He said, don't you go up there. And if you do, God won't be with you. But they presumed they'd go anyhow. God's too good. He, he, he won't do nothing to us. God's with us, so what do we care? Pentecostal, don't you never put that in your head? Amen. Women, I can bob my hair. I can do this. I can Amen. do that. Man, I can do this. I can go like this. As long as I belong. Uh, God healed me one time. God give me the Holy Ghost one time. God did this. God did that. That's right. But don't you trust as across that dividing line? Amen. Moses said, if you go up there, I'm not going with you. And the Amalekites and Canaanites are up there. And I'm going to tell you that sin lays beyond the boundaries of God's word. To disbelieve one eye of the other, God will let you sit there. <laughs> oh, uh, it's such a job such a terrible thing. I love people. Why do I have to do this? John. Just go on like the rest of them. As long as I belong to church, what difference does it make? It does make a difference. The old prophet told Israel the same thing. He said, did I ever tell you anything in the name of the Lord but what comes to pass? They said, no, all you said... Samuel, it all come to pass. So did I ever go out and take up offerings among you to build big buildings and so on? No, you never did do that, Samuel. Well, so then listen to me. You don't want to act like the rest of the nation. God is your king. And I'm saying today, Pentecost, don't try to act like the rest of the churches. God is your father. The word is your state. 
Have I ever told you anything about what comes to pass? Have I ever tucked your money and begged you for big programs and all kinds of things? Tell me one time I ever took it off of you. Tell me one thing you never was said in the name of the Lord, but what comes to pass? Amen. Now listen. Stay with the Word. For the message of the last day has the messenger and the message has to be according to the end time. Restoring the faith of the children back to the faith of the Bible. Didn't you say over there they've already that earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints just 96 years. That 80, 96, I believe it was, that already gotten away from it. Did not they come in and begin to become a, a thought, then a doctrine, and then it become an issue of the Nicolaitans? The word Nicol means to conquer. Conquer the lady. Spirit of that laity. Instead of what y'all be doing up here, let the Holy Spirit move amongst the people as one holy land. Holy man, there is no such a thing. It's the Holy Ghost Amen. in the church. Nickel conquered the laity and, and become a doctrine. What did the first thing they do? Made an organization. In there they put, uh, and for hundreds of hundreds of years, it was a persecution. It all wouldn't bow to that. It was pulled asunder, burnt, persecuted. Then along come Luther. A tree started to grow, and what he did, he organized it. God cut the branch off, and it withered and died, like Jesus said he pruned it. Up come the west, there another branch coming out on it. What did they do? Organize. God pruned it and cut it off. Along come the third message, just exactly the way the church began, that bride tree at the beginning. It started out, who come first? John, preaching justification, repenting. Who come next? Jesus Christ, sanctify them, Father, through the truth, thy word, which was himself in the truth. Sanctification. What was the next? The baptism of the Holy Ghost. I send a promise to my Father upon you. And the bride tree started growing. But here come the canker worm. Eat off this. The palm worm. Eat off the fruit. Next eat off the leaves. Next eat off the bark. And then the caterpillar come a sucker. He sucked the very life out of it and made a conqueror of the land. Yeah. God said, I'll restore it. Amen. Here it started up in the days of Luther. It organized. God proved it. As he said he would do. John 15. Up come the Wesley. Fine. Got a nice brain started out. What did he do? Organize it. After Wesley's death, they cut it off. Up come the Pentecostal. Bringing forth the youth. Signs of the fruit. What did he do? Organize it. She's cut off. But I will restore, saith the Lord. He's going to do it. What's the matter with these great revivals? Now let's be sensible. We've had what we call a revival. But what did we hatch out of it? Members. Why? Why, brother? The Bible said in Hebrews 6, The rain cometh off upon the earth to dress its water, prepare it, or which is to be the fruit. But the thorns and thistles, which is not your rejection, will be burned. Now, they're, they're burning them to burn them. That's true. They're getting burned. All these organizations, big bundles, are coming to one big bundle. Amen. That's right. What is that fun? You know what it is, World Council Churches. Forming the image of the beast. Truly. And you people are scared of communism? I want you to show me one place in the Bible where communism will rule the world. Well, I'll tell you the Bible says that Romanism will rule the world. Exactly right. Where did the beast go out in it? A prophet who's seen all the Gentile kingdom come right down. At the end, it didn't go communism, it went Romanism. Amen. Exactly. Here we are in these days, people pursuing, joining right into that thing. So that's all right. That's it. Sure. I belong to church. Oh, yes, I'm so and so. See? Now look. He said there will be light in the evening time. That's to ripen the evening. The fruits can only ripen by the light. We know that. And that's the top of the tree. The evening light. All the rest of it. But way back there, that predestinated word of God has stayed there all the time because God spoke it. I will restore it. He will do it no matter how many organizations and things he has to prune off. There will be a church. Yeah. A spot of ankle for our will restore us, the Lord. It's got to what? All the years that the canker worm eaten. All the years that the caterpillars eaten. All the years that the denominations and suckers and things 
on the tree, took its fruit away, took its vines away, took its bark away, took the life out of it, but I will restore for the rooted offspring. Amen. Amen. I will restore, says he. What is it? He said so. He predestinated it. His word lays here. Therefore, look just exactly the way he done it the first time. He took John, justification. Jesus sanctified the church with his own blood. And then the Holy Ghost came. Then along come the church, begin to grow. Loose to them. Here come these four termites in. One, the same insect, just in different stages. Along come the, uh, the palmer worm. What did it do? First thing, it took the fruit, brother love, off of it. Next thing, come around was the canker worm. And come around, another worm, come around and eat off the joy, the leaves, the fellowship. The next come along. What did he do? He eat off the bark, the canker worm. What next come the caterpillar and suck the life right out of it? But there was a stump called Joseph. I will restore. <laughs> that predestinated root. Hallelujah. And all them means that was before the foundation of the world predestinated. All that the Father has given me will come to me. Yes, sir. All that he foreknew, he calls. All that he calls, he justifies. All that he justifies, he has glorified. Paul, part of Ephesians 1 by, uh, uh, Ephesians 1 by, he said, God predestinated us before the foundation of the world to the adoption of sons in Jesus Christ. How are you going to stop it? All oh, devils in hell, you might as well quit fussing about it. It's going to be there with a spot of it. It's going to be a what? A blast Hallelujah! God said, I will restore. Restore what? One without an organization touched to it. One with a pure, unadulterated word. It has to come. Amen. Why did we get a bunch of denominations this time out of this revival? We sowed denomination seed. What we need today, brother, you can say what you want to about it. We need the gospel, pure, holy, unadulterated word of God. So that when this light comes out, it'll bring forth that church. God predestined. Hey, Amen. Don't pursue them about nothing. Take God's word and leave that on. He promised he'd be here. He's here. Hey, Amen. I better stop. Too much good God. He loves me too much to punish me. He promises he loved Adam and he loved Eve. He is love. But he's just. He has to keep his word. If you believe this to be a word of God, anything contrary to this, any man will take out or add to the same will be taken out of his part of the book of life. Preacher, denomination, whatever it is. What about all these creeps and things that's made up amongst man? God never does deal with a group. He deals with an individual. Groups have different ideas. Show me one time he ever did it. Deals with an individual. Amen. Dealing with you, deals with me, deals with the next man. That's right. It's an individual affair. Israel pursued that he was just so good, they'd seen so many things that they could just do anything they wanted to. Like that teenage boy. That's the way the church is today. They feel it. Well, God gave me the Holy Ghost. If I want to do this, I can do it. Hallelujah. No condemnation to me. I'm in Christ. That right there shows that you're not there. Amen. If that was you was in Christ... You'd hold against one regardless of what anybody said. If you had to stand by yourself, you'd stand by it. Because it's the Spirit of God in you vindicating His Word. Not one word of it will ever pass to its full bill. So precious and so darling. It's just like God, He don't judge about church. He don't judge the world by organizations. He judges the church by His, or judges the world by His Word like He did even Adam. The way God starts, he cannot finish in other ways. That's to finish the same way he started if he didn't be done wrong in the first place. See? Don't pursue and believe. Don't venture out without authority, without scriptural authority. Sense and pursue. Oh, well, ma. Oh, I know I, I can't, I ain't got my locks anymore, but I pursue it's all right. I'm still the same old guy. No, no, brother. You cross the separating line. He presumed he just had as much strength as he could. Now he stretched himself. Now, I'm just as good a man as ever was, but he found that his strength was gone. That's what we did when the revival started about 14 years ago. Pentecostal found out she couldn't stretch herself no more. 
because she organized with little groups and hated one another, so that discord amongst brother and the revival struck it in the evening light come in. But what could she do? She couldn't do nothing because she's organized. She's lost her strength, her brotherly love, the fruits of the Spirit. Samson thought, he's still there. I can't, you better be feeling <laughs> He's still there. Achan thought, when he tucked away, oh, it won't be noticed. Oh, after that preacher said, oh, Brother Ben, just make a difference with this way or that way. It sure makes a difference. Amen. That's the very loudest Satan told him. Does make a difference. Well, as long as the rest of them does it, I don't care who does it or who doesn't do it. I want to do it anyhow. I'm not presuming that that's all right, but it's because the rest of them does it. God requires this, and this is what I've got to have. Amen. The rest of them don't come. I can only say it. Just keep on going. Amen. No presuming nothing about it. Don't pull no punches from nowhere. Amen. Yes. Weakness. Aiken says it won't be noticed. It don't make any difference. But it did make a difference. That one little wedge upset the whole program of God. Just be baptized anyway to make any difference. As long as you're a member of the church, it doesn't hurt. That's what's upset the revival. That's what's the matter. We got a bunch of denominations. Amen. Instead of having saints. Got charters, decision makers. What good is a stone without a mason to cut it and shape it and knock the corners off of it? When you see a sculpture standing working on a stone, it don't look like very much, but he's got in his mind what he's trying to make. So he rolls the stone up there for a purpose. And he's got to shave it and cut it and hone it. Stones that profess to be Christians. They'll go out here and act any way and pursuing this is all right, pursuing that's all right. They stand still and the sculpture of the Holy Ghost cuts them into images of sons and daughters of God. Oh, boy. He's a rose of Sharon in the lily of the valley. Morning star of the alpha omega begins to be. He that was which is and shall come the root and offspring of David. Hallelujah. Yes. Pursue him, it's all right. The Egyptians, they saw Israel circumcised, cross the Dead Sea. They presumed that they were just as good a man as they were. They went behind them and drowned it. They presumed it was all right. I got a herd. Noah's time. They presumed if it come a flood like Noah said it would do, well, the only thing they'd do is jump in their own boat. But there was only one boat that was God constructed. That's the way with the people today. They say, I'm going to church. I do this, I do that. But there's only one group that's God constructed, and that's not a denomination of construction, it's a word construction. Revelation of his power. God constructed both. Don't pursue. Just believe God's word. Noah constructed that boat out of a certain kind of wood. Wish we had time to go into it, but we don't. I took that shit of wood. Did you ever see it? It's lighter than balsam. Well, if anybody see a man trying to build a boat out of that kind of wood, they say it's crazy. Why, it's the lightest wood you throw. You throw a shit of wood out there in the water, it's go sink right there. That's the way God does. <laughs> He just, just pulls it right over and sat there and ignorant as jackrabbits. Yeah. <laughs> there. He said, well, what to do? They don't try to have any wisdom of their own. They can't figure it out. She's not supposed to figure it out. You're supposed to believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. So take shit of wood. It's just, just, just as light like a sponge. But now notice, after you got all that shit of wood destructed, constructed rather, he said, go and take pitch. And soak it up. Oh, how did they get pitch in them days? They took another kind of tree, pine tree, and they beat it and beat it until the pitch ran out of it. What's the type of a timber God's got today? Empty out all your old fanatic stuff. Empty out all your organization. Get real light and stay before God. Then he beat one of us. 
He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Amen. He was beat and wounded and bruised to Calvary that his spirit might pour into you when you have nothing. Amen. And then that boat, that ark, when that's set up in there, even a nail couldn't be drove into it. That's the reason the big logs hitting against it wouldn't bust a hole in it. Why, oak, pine, or nothing else would hold like that. See, it was already soaked up. It was pitched inside and out. That's right. Amen. That's why a Christian is. He empties himself. I don't want to know about anybody. I want to know, Lord, I want to know you. I want you, your will, your life. Then God just, you just soak up in Christ. Well, then what was it? It actually would not be shedding wood anymore. It would be time. Not you no more. It's the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, my. God constructed. So many prophets today telling so many different things gets the people confused. Amen. Don't pursue. Just watch his vindicated promise. That's it. Deuteronomy 18, 22. God said if there be one among you spiritual or prophet, what he says comes to pass and you hear him. If it doesn't come to pass, then don't hear him. John 14, 12, Jesus said, He that believeth in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Mark 16 said, These signs shall follow them and believe. Not they'll join the church and put their name on the book and live a good life. But in my name they shall cast out devils and speak with me. Amen. Oh, sir. John never pursued that he'd go out there. John, you know, when he, he was uh, out of the lineage of a priest. Isn't it strange? John looked like to actually follow the order of his father because he was out of a strict priesthood. But you know, the job was too great. John didn't want to get mixed up in any of the theology. God took him out in the wilderness alone and schooled him out there. Amen. Or he said, John, they'll be having all kinds of things and getting you to believe all kinds of unscriptural things. But here it'll be, John. Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on. He's the one that'll baptize. John didn't have to say, I presume that this is a good man. I presume that that's a good man. I presume he's going to come to you Pharisees. You oneness, you trinity. You this, that's who he's going to come to you. John said, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending. Amen. Brother, not your organization. Amen. These signs shall follow them and believe. Works that I do shall you do also. You don't have to worry, wonder. God done said what to look for. Evening fruits. Evening light. He said in the last days if he devil would send his ministers in, angels of light. Yeah. Trying to bring you something new, something more popular, something more educated. Don't you believe it? That's what he's done. He got the trouble. Stay with the word. Amen. Amen. Don't pursue. Take God's word. He pursued it. It was all right. God's a good God. You know he would. Surely the Lord will not do this or do that. But God had promised that God had to do it. It was God's duty to do it. Now, don't presume, just believe. John said, I knew him, because I seen the Messiah sign on him. And I know this is him. He didn't presume. Nathaniel didn't have to presume. Not at all. When he told him. He know, he know what Deuteronomy 1822 said. So he said, Thou art an Israelite. Indeed. No God. He said, When did you know me? When did you ever see me? He said, Before Philip called you. <laughs> he didn't have to presume. <laughs> He said, Rabbi! Mm. Rabbi! Teacher! Although the schools are making fun of your teaching, they're turning you out on account of your teaching. Amen. But Rabbi, you are the Son of God! Yeah. You're the King of Israel. You didn't pursue me, you had a scriptural evidence of it. Amen. That's what the Messiah would do. You didn't pursue me. That poor, little old, dirty, stinking prostitute. Maybe all the organizations in the country, maybe it excommunicated her. Yeah. But she didn't see anything in it to begin with. If she sees something real, she'd take it. So she seen an ordinary Jew sitting over there. She thought, looked like an ordinary man. He didn't have his collar all turned around, a great big turban, Dr. Reverend, Holy Father. He's just a man. Just like the rest of the man. Set and lean back there, probably a little bit gray. He's only 30-something years old, but the Bible said he only looked 50. Did you know that? 
They said, you say you're not a man over 50 years old. Say you've seen Abraham. Now we know that you are God a devil. He said, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> now we know you got a devil. <laughs> See, they're blind. He said, you blind Pharisees, blind leading of the blind. Amen. That's it. Now we see him sitting there. That little woman said to him, she said, um, well, you want the, you Jews who want to argue religion. That was the custom of the day, like today. You Jews say that's over here, down here, and all so and so. And we say, he said, go get your husband, come here. She said, I don't have any husband. I said, that's right. You got five. And the one you're living with now is not yours. Look, we said, that predestinated seed land. Amen. Fire. Hallelujah. Ah. What? Could not be anything else. That predestinated seed. And when that water <laughs> began to fall on that seed, it started blooming. Yeah. You didn't have to tell her. She knew. She said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. We know the Messiah's coming. We're looking for him. And when he comes, he'll tell us these kind of things. He said, I'm he. She said, that's good enough. <laughs> no perceiving. She didn't come and say, say you doctors of divinity. I would like to take you all in a scriptural argument. <laughs> she said, I'm not presuming nothing. Come see a man. That's told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Christ? That's it. She didn't have to pursue, venture out without authority. She had authority. She had scriptural authority to believe in. Oh, woman, you don't know. You don't belong to our school. You don't know any of these organizations. I don't care what you say. I know what thus saith the Lord is. They said he'll be a prophet, and there he is. Amen. She had scriptural authority. She didn't pursue. What school did this come from? It come from the Bible. That's right. Oh, sure. The disciples of Pentecost. Now you Pentecostal people get your hats on. You can shout with this. Notice. What if the disciples said, Well, now listen. I tell you, Matthew goes over and says to Peter, Peter won't ask you something. Did not our Lord tell us to wait up here, come up, and he's going to send the promise of the Father upon us? Oh, sure. Yeah, Peter said, that's right. What do you think, Mark? Mark, oh, sure, he said that. Yep. He said he's going to do it. Well, brethren, we've been up here nine days. You know, the other day, I had a funny feeling. You know, I just kind of believed it. Don't you think that we ought not to wait any longer? I presume we've already got it. Because he told us to wait here. Well, here, I believe you we've done have your nine days. So I suppose we might as well go on with our ministry. I presume we've already got it because we obeyed him. There's where you Pentecostals missed it by a million miles. Amen. 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 You went after a sensation instead of waiting for the word to be fulfilled. Amen. That's right. That's why you organize. That's why you listen to those. It's always the leaders that get the people out of the will of God. It was Korah. No, it was Korah, that uninspired leader that said, they, Moses tries to think he's the only holy man. Well, we've got as much holy man here. We've got groups out here. Didn't God put the spirit of prophecy up on all these people? Took it off of Moses and put it on here. So we'll just listen to this group. Moses thinks he's something. God told Moses, separate yourself from him. I'll, I'll sink him in his group, his whole organization. Right. Moses was God's leader. Amen. Moses was vindicated to be that leader. Amen. All didn't listen to him perish. Amen. Jesus Amen. was God's leader. Amen. The Holy Ghost is his leader. Amen. And all that don't obey the Holy Ghost call this Bible. Amen. Amen. To perish. Amen. So wait, we just wait. I believe I tell you now, we've got it. Let's just go out. No, they didn't do that. They know that Isaiah 28, 11 said precept must be upon precept. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Hold fast to that what's good. For with stammering lips and other tongues will I speak to this people, and this is the Sabbath keeping. The rest that calls the weary. They know that scripture must be applied no longer more than how long they waited or what they did. They wasn't presuming nothing. They was waiting for the scripture to be fulfilled. They know that Joel said, listen, if Peter jumped right out there and a few minutes later, then the very next day and preach on Joel. Joel said, and it shall come to pass, Joel 2.28, in the last days that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. 
Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy of all my handmaids and maidservants when I pour out of my spirit. I'll show signs in the heaven above and wonders in the earth below, fire and pillars of smoke and vapor. It shall come to pass before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They were waiting. They wasn't presuming to have anything. They were waiting until the scripture was made manifest. Glory. Oh, brother, I wish it wasn't this late. I would like to stay there a little while. They waited for scriptural authority. Today we just take the creed, a sensation, a little smoke or fire, or some little sensation, somebody say, Glory to God, we got it, hallelujah. See all in my hand? Look up here. Oh, goodness. Look at your head, what kind of shape it is in. <laughs> I didn't say that to be smart, excuse me, forgive me. I didn't mean I hardly said that. Something was said to me, don't do that. Let it alone. If the blind leads the blind, they'll fall in the ditch. Without scriptural authority, they take it by creed. Say this creed. They presume that's all right. They go on. Take it by sensation. Oh, glory to God, I spoke in tongues all night. I've seen devils do the same thing. Sure. You don't believe that in speaking in tongues? Sure, I believe it. That's not it. I'm a missionary. <laughs> I've seen them drink blood out of a human skull and speak in tongues and call on the devil. Certainly, oh yeah. My mother, we just buried her recently. She's a half Indian. I've been in the camps and watched the witch doctor speak in tongues and lay a pencil down and raise up right in unknown tongues. Certainly, don't tell me that then. Oh no. Amen. Mercy, goodness. Amen. Some of the people are speaking tongues and they got the Holy Ghost and did not half of his word. Amen. And sometimes all of his power. Amen. The Holy Ghost will bear record on his word. Amen. How can the Holy Ghost tell you to do something and turn back around and say, no, it's all right, let's go ahead and do this other. Amen. Don't do it. He didn't do it that with Eve. He didn't do it at the beginning. If he'd done it now and didn't do it there, then he's unjust. Amen. Because of all the suffering when we'd have been here anyhow. God's a great contractor. Our bodies were laid out here but when the world was built. We were calcium, potash, petroleum, cosmic light, 16 different elements of the world. It's in us. And God made the world before he made man. He's a contractor. He laid it out. He was going to call him out of the dust of the earth. But he disbelieved God's word. What the Lord? And it caused women to bring forth children. But that predestinated word of God laying out down there will bring that predestinated one. When he speaks, he'll come out of the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know my Redeemer liveth. Last days he'll stand on the earth with the skin worms destroys his body. He'll speak and I'll answer him. Amen. He'll call and I'll answer him. Sure. Amen. We're going to stop. Saying you got the Holy Ghost in spoken tongues and ask you. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Well then how was your man? It's going to make a difference. It does. Amen. Amen. I do this. It don't make any difference where I dress this way or that. The Bible says it does. Amen. Don't make any difference where I do this or that. The Bible says it does. Amen. There you are. Better leave it all. Let the teachers say that. All right. Today we just take it for granted, for assuming. Say we have it. Yeah, sure, I did this. I, I shook all night. You know what? I got blood in my hands. That shows I got it. You got blood. In your hand, you might have that. And then turn around and deny the Word of God. Amen. And say you got the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Holy Ghost will say amen to every word. Because it wrote the Word. It is the Word. Sure. Stop presuming. Wait till all that temper, sin, and things gone away from you so God can fill you up. Moses one time presumed because without a witness or without an experience, he had heard the word that he was to be a deliverer, but he didn't have the call. He didn't have the experience. So he pursued that he could go right out and take over. That's what the people think today. Oh, we're going to have a revival. I want to see a revival in our age. All oh, you all make your confession. We want, we want more stones. We want this, that, or the other. We, we want decisions to be made. What is it? How are you going to have a revival up on that? When you're sowing Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, and Presbyterian seed. And denying the seed of God, the Word. Jesus said the Word is a seed, the Bible. God's Word is a seed. How are you going to bring forth a Bible church with a denominational seed? 
What do you say? Bless God, Brother Brown. The Holy Ghost did this. I shouted and screamed. Did you know the same water that was sent to make the wheat makes the, makes the stink wheat just as happy as it does the wheat? How did it get in there? It makes a creeper. It makes a bra. Why? They're thirsty. It's in the field when the, the rain comes on the just and the unjust. Say, I shouted for the rain. I danced in the spirit. I spoke in tongues. God made those things too. But what kind of a fruit is in there? By the fruit you shall know that. The fruit of the spirit is the word of God. Manifesting itself. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, make us faith, faith, and want the word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the word. Got to do it. Sure. Moses pursued. Oh, I got a head full of knowledge. I'll do it. But he didn't have the call. He didn't have the experience. Sure, he went out pursuing. Pursuing on something he ought not do. But after he met the burning bush up there one day. Oh, brother. When he heard the voice of God. He gave him a scriptural base, not what his mammy told him. But what God told him. I am the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. And the God of Jacob. Called him his prince name. Renamed him. I have heard the cries of my people, and I've seen their afflictions by the taskmaster. I remember my promised word. Lord! He still remembers his promised word. I will restore, saith the Lord. All that the denomination of bugs and crickets and palmer worms and canker worms and caterpillars that eat up, all their denominational isms and creeds and things that they eat up, I remember my word. And I'm come down the midst of people. I will restore, saith the Lord. Don't pursue me, right. The Bible tells you what's right and wrong. We just better quit. I've kept you an hour and more. I will restore. Don't pursue. The Holy Ghost is here. The Bible's here. The Holy Ghost bears record of the Word of God ever promised. I owe you. It says amen to it. Don't pursue. It's all right because you had a sensation. Take inventory of ourselves this morning. Look around and see what we believe. See if we, if God said a certain thing, if we tally with it. Well, you say, I'd be put out of my church if I did this or did that. Well, which is more to you, your God or your church? Amen. Don't pursue me without an experience. Someone said to me not long ago, said, Brother Brown, don't you believe in purgatory? I said, sure. Oh, I see you're Catholic. I said, yeah. Catholic means universal. I'm a great Pentecostal Catholic. <laughs> of the original church. Somebody said they got a proclamation out now, Pope John the 22nd or 252nd or something other. He said, uh, he said, all the people come back to the original church. The original church begin in Rome. That's a lie. The church never began in Rome. I'll sanction with the man. Let the church go back where it started from. Pentecost. Glory. Or he's going to restore. Sure, the denominations are going back to Rome where they come from. But hallelujah, God's going to restore any part of the fathers. Hallelujah. I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for sinners. Give him glory, all ye people. For his blood has washed away ye stain. He stained of underneath. Setting together in heavenly places, the Holy Spirit, through a person that wouldn't harm you for nothing. How could I harm God's children? But yield yourself and see the word come forth. It's a circumcisor. Amen. 
cuts to the heart, knows exactly what you're thinking of, and reproduces it right through the same vessels. Okay. I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for unbelievers. holding the blood that dropped off the veins off the cross I had it how I would hold it to my heart and walk watch every step what I made it cherish in that blood is two drops of the literal blood I would hold it but you know what according to God I've got under my holding this morning this morning in his sight a greater than that I've got the purchase of his blood that's what he shed his blood for to purchase you how must I handle it can I see sin begin to creep again and, and contaminate? Oh, no, no. I can't do it. I've got to shove them things away. Cut it away. This is it. Stay with the word, brother. You love him? Thank you for staying with me. Help him. It's 1230. And I'm sorry. I can... No, I'm not. God forgive me. That's wrong to say that. I had nothing to do with it. He did it himself. Amen. And, I, and I, I just love you. I believe in you. I believe that God's going to have a church, and I believe you're part of that church. And I love you with godly love. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will let that word be interpreted in the spirit that it was meant for as it goes out to you. Now I give to your your pastor. Now if you can, you come back tonight. And be with us again tonight. Get the baptism this afternoon over brother's house. Come here, Brother Parker. Excuse me for calling your first name, but they said Peter, James, John, and so forth. God bless you. Brother Park, bless you, Brother Brown.